Uh, my name is John Noble. I'm from uh, Proactive. Um, Proactive is a direct marketing services provider, and one of our core business functions is that of data. And this afternoon, I want to talk to you about the issue of big data, um, how that relates to marketeers, because it's not just a marketing issue, it's, a, it's, a, it's an IT technical issue for many businesses. But I want to try and see, look at how it relates to, to marketing and how it might be relevant to you. Um, thank you all for coming. It's, it's well attended. I thought a, a seminar on data at the end of the last day um, was not going to be very well attended. And one of the challenges is trying to make data sound interesting, which, which hopefully I'll, I'll do. Um, so I'm going to look at... Um, we're going to try and, I guess, define big data, um, look at what the challenges are, um, how it can be used by marketing, what the benefits are to marketing, what some of the challenges are. Um, it's a very new topic area, um, and it's one that's, that's going to hit hard and fast. Um, in fact, uh, this show next year is going to be co-located alongside the big data show. So you're going to hear a lot more about big data if you haven't heard, heard too much about it already. Um, before I start, I just wanted to get a, a feel for feel for what's going on in the audience, because there is the technical aspect and there is the marketing aspect. Can I assume that most of you are all marketeers? Could I have a show of hands for, for the marketing people in the audience? Okay, that's good. And the technical people? Okay, right, okay. It's going to be a challenge. Um, the idea is to look at it from a marketing perspective. So there is, there is a technical angle, but I don't want to stand here for the next half an hour and, and talk technical at you. Um, I guess if you have anything more along the lines of technical questions, perhaps we could do that, do that afterwards or, or come see me on stand. We are exhibiting at the show. So first of all, what I want to try and do is to define what big data is. And, and before I do that, again, I just want to get a feel, feel for your understanding. Um, how many people are familiar with the term big data? OK, a few, but, but there's also a few that aren't. OK. Well, I'm going to start with defining. So those who are familiar with it, um, if you might, might have to just, just stick, with me, stick with me on this. Um, to try and give it some uh, a definition, um, according to IBM, uh, every day we're, we're now creating 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. Um, in any language, that's a lot of data. I actually had to look up quintillion to find out what it was because it's such a big number. Um, but that really is one of the, one of the key characteristics of big data is, is the scale and the volume. Um, the other issue is the rate at which um, we're collecting data and creating data. And over 90% of the world's data has really been created in the last two years. So it's something that's explosive in terms of its, in terms of its growth. And that's why it's hit us. It's hit us hard and it, and it, and it will be a challenge, challenge for all of us. Um, where does it come from? Well, there's a whole host of different channels. And from a marketeer's perspective, um, one of the key growth areas is social media. So obviously, every tweet, every post on Facebook, every like, every interaction on LinkedIn is creating some form of data that is stored somewhere. And obviously, an explosive growth in, in social media, that's where some of this data is coming from. It could be communication. So for example, any text you send, any email you send, any electronic communication that you make is creating data that's going to be stored somewhere. It could be something like pictures, for example, those of us who take pictures and upload them to Flickr or, or other social networks um, to show our friends and family. Again, it's creating data. It's being stored somewhere. Video is another, another example, such as um, YouTube. Obviously, people, we're all videographers now. We're all photographers. Um, we're all walking around with smartphones that can create video. We create video. We upload it. That has to be stored. It could be traditional things like purchase transactions, which we're more familiar with. Um, so, for example, you go into Tesco's or Sainsbury's or wherever and, and buy your groceries. That information is captured and put into, a, put into a database. It could be something like GPS signals, and geolocation is something that, that's relevant for marketeers now, working out where people are and delivering communications to them based upon where they are at that moment in time. So we've got a whole host of different sources. Sensors could be another thing. I've stuck sensors in. It's not really related to marketing. But um, we have climate change sensors. We're, we're, we're sensing wind direction, wind speed, weather. We've got lots of technology collecting data. And there's a mass of data. Um, so I guess what is big data? It's a lot of data. Um, this bit's probably, for, the, for those that are technical amongst us who are familiar with big data, this, this might be familiar. This is kind of IBM's definition of the, the three characteristics of big data. Volume is, is, is probably the obvious one which we've covered in terms of the amount of data that's being created every day. And, and obviously, we used to measure data in terms of bits and bytes and then megabyte, kilobytes, megabytes, terabytes, zettabytes. I don't know what the next measurement's going to be, but it's coming simply because there's just so much data out there. We need to scale up the definitions in order to be able to talk about them effectively. 
Another key thing is the sort of variety of data. As you can see it all comes from a whole host of different sources. Some of that data is very structured. For example, if you're going to the supermarket, you're buying things. That data is captured in a very structured way and is quite usable. Perhaps things like um, tweets on Twitter isn't so structured and it's harder to do something with it. So there's different types of data and that's one of the characteristics. There's all this data and it's a case of what can we do with it, what can't we do with it. Then, of course, the velocity at which it's hitting us. And um, historically, transactional information will be based on people going to shops and doing things. Um, data's coming at us a lot quicker than it used to be. After it's real time, it's streaming at us, it's coming at us hard and fast. And it's a characteristic to be aware of because, as a marketeer, if you're going to do something with the data, you need to understand how you're going to use that data in terms of how it's actually coming at you. So I'm going to try and link this now to, 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 to from a marketing perspective and what the marketing opportunity is. I'm going to go over some of these sources again and how they've grown over time. And in this graph, we're essentially trying to look at, uh, on, 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 on the left there, we're looking at basically what, how much volume of data is available and how that's really progressed over time, just to show how quickly it's come at us. Historically, as marketeers, maybe two decades ago, um, we were pretty much relying on sales data, interaction with customers. They'd buy something, we could record it and, and do something with that. We've seen the growth of technology, things have changed, and those amongst us who do email marketing are probably familiar with collecting uh, demographics, just people who are opening emails and clicking on emails. We're getting a lot of feedback, and that's, that's coming in. Um, CRM really sort of came into play around sort of, sort of, sort of the turn of the millennium, and again, that was, that was treating data in a different way and managing the customer in a different way, rather than just dumping data in a database and just using it now and again. CRM was looking really more at how you can get more out of your data and how you can manage your customer experience. And in doing so, that, that in turn created more data for the marketeer. Um, the, I'm sure there's many among you who are using um, uh, things like Google Analytics and analyzing what's going on with your website. So people are interacting with your website. It's creating data that's going into a database that you may or may, may not use. I'm going to skip through the next few. They kind of all sort of hit at the same time, digital apps, social media, mobile and tablets. Um, this is where the explosion in, 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 in data collection, certainly in terms of um, the marketing function, has come from. Um, and it's got to the point now where we have got big data. What masses of data are available to us? And it presents an opportunity for marketeers. If we can basically take this data and harness it and do something with it, um, it has got some opportunities for you. Um, there's a recent uh, survey conducted by Neil Ayn and the US Start Marketing Association. And unfortunately, most of the research that's been done has been done in the US. There's actually been very little that's, c that's come out of the UK yet um, because it's so, so new. To, to, look, to, to really look at what the chief marketing officers in the United States are talking about, and, and the top 1,000 were interviewed um, to find out what their thoughts were and, and how big data could be a benefit to marketing. One of the, one of, I guess it's a fairly obvious one to, one to look at, but one of the larger benefits to the marketeer is to gain better insight into, into your customers and their behavior, which is fairly obvious. If you're getting that feedback from all of these channels and looking at what people are doing, it's giving you insight that you perhaps never had before. You know, if, you rely, if you go back the two decades, just relying on what people spent with you, it's very difficult to track engagement. And obviously engagement is something that as marketeers will try and strive to achieve. That can now be measured in a way it could never be measured before. And obviously that... That information, that data is going into the pot. So marketers are looking at how they can gain better insight into customers and perhaps drive marketing strategy and the like for, for off, off the back of that insight. The actual biggest benefit or perceived benefit to marketers in terms of harnessing um, big data was the ability to, to drive better campaign response and conversion rates. Because if you've got this data and you can do something with that, you can actually influence the, the performance of your campaigns and that obviously gives you more ROI and, hit, and hits the bottom line. So that's sort of what, probably the biggest perceived benefit. The next two I'll skip through because there's, there's a few people out there that still don't under, understand what they, can, what they can get from it. And there's some other responses that probably aren't worth discussing. So we looked at the benefits of um, um, big data, but it, but it all sounds great, but there are some challenges as well in terms of harnessing what we can do. So the same group of people were surveyed and to see what they thought the biggest challenges were. And one of the biggest challenges was being able to analyze and, and mine and, and, and gain that insight into the data. If we've got masses and masses of data, um, it presents a number of problems. What data do you need to keep? What data do you need to analyze? Um, what are you hoping to find? And so that's one of the big challenges. We've got all this data, but um, how, how do we analyze it? How do we mine it? 
another technical issue, probably, I suppose, the techies amongst us will be more familiar with the storage and how, how you access it. And, and often this data is coming at us from different directions and different places. Um, things are very, fairly disjointed. Many organizations may have a CRM. They may have a database that sits on the back of their website. They may be pulling information from their so social media. Um, they may have traditional data capture methods, um, data stored in lots of different places. And, and so how you store this data, um, ideally in one place, and how you actually access the data. Um, another challenge is how you can use this data to, to, to kind of be used by marketing. Because there is so much data, one of the challenges is what data do you use? What data should you be thinking of using? Um, you know, it, it, there, is, there is an argument that you could have too much data and you're keeping data for the sake of keeping data. Um, so it's quite important to think about what data do you really need and, and what should you be looking at? And then, of course, there's the arbitrary, very small percentage of other people that, 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 that couldn't think of any challenges. Um, if you think of the, the last slide, the largest, I, I suppose, one of the largest benefits in terms of um, getting something from big data is the ability to analyze and, and mine that data. And certainly with some of the clients we've been working with, um, by successfully analyzing and mining data, it has hit the bottom line, ha has improved ROI. I'm going to give a very, sort of, not so much a case study, but an example of some, some work that we've done where, where we show how we did it and, and, and what the results were. Um, one, of, one of our clients that we work with is Oracle, and Oracle um, are well known for, for database technology, and, and ironically, they get us to actually do some of their data mining and analysis for them. And um, th they have a big data problem. They have lots and lots and lots of data. And, and in terms of driving campaigns, driving response rates, and getting results, how can they get the best out of all of this data? So the marketeers at Oracle will produce a campaign brief and essentially look at what they want to achieve from the campaign and who they believe the best people are to target. That, that brief and the data comes to us, and then essentially we overlay other databases and other intelligence that we can get. Um, for, for example, we'll be looking within their database at what um, might be hardware or software products that they have installed and look at the propensities to, to purchase this new product or upgrade based upon the information they already have, overlaying things like um, sales rep lists so sales reps can follow up the campaign and basically integrate, integrate the whole campaign. And off the back of that, we can produce very, very niche direct mail, sales, and email lists that are all in integrated and all linked. Um, historically, they would just do an extract from the database and just do something with it. And the, the ROI they were getting, if they were lucky, is sort of two, three, four, four euros to, to every one euro spent. And by, by, by doing the model that we implemented, they're now getting a 72 euro return for every one euro spent on that marketing campaign. And, and the difference between what they were traditionally getting and what they're getting now is through clever use of the data and, and really getting down into the data, finding out exactly who are the right people and producing very, very niche lists that are then worked very hard by marketing. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a question come out. I'd love like to do a Q&A at the end, but I'll answer your question. One of the questions the gentleman asked was, was this all data Oracle owned or was it data coming in from other places? Predominantly it's all d data that Oracle owned. And one of the issues they've had as an organization, they've been very acquisition hungry and they've been buying up lots of different organizations and suddenly they've got lots of different client databases, lots of CRMs. Um, ideally, they'd put it all in one pot. Um, but in the meantime, until they can do that, they've got to get the best out of it. And now they do hardware and they do software. And there's issues in terms of what hardware you might have and the propensity to buy certain types of software. So it's, it's trying to put it all, to, all together into one place and apl apply what they're trying to achieve from their campaign to get the best results out of it. But anyone who's got a, a big data issue and lots and lots of data, it's not always about using the volume of data. It's finding the quality that sits within that big pool of data to get the most out of it. Um, there are some issues with big data, and certainly our, our view is one of the, the fail, there's a failure of, of um, big data for marketing. Um, and it really, really relates to how data is collected. Um, another survey that's done by the Columbia Business School found that um, over 90% of corporate marketeers believe that successful brands will use data effectively. Um, what we found is that there's a desire out there to be data driven, but when it actually comes to practice, there's a massive gap, a, a huge gap. Um, and part of the research co conducted by the Columbia Business School looked at what types of data people were collecting. And in this research, um, they're looking at 
what we, I guess we call traditional data and digital data. Now, traditional data is quite well, what, quite well collected, things like demographics, it might be customer transaction data or customer user data. Um, systems are in place to capture that information. It's been around a while. Where the challenges really apply is how you collect digital data, such as things like social media content, um, social network ties, customer mobile data. And it's all this new technology that's creating all this new data that's coming at us. And, and that's where the gap is in terms of those that want to use data more effectively and those that are using data, um, the ability to collect that data is, is, is one, probably one of the biggest failures for, for in terms of a marketing perspective. Um, and, and so it really relates to the challenges related around digital data. Um, I mean, essentially, as it stands, you can really identify, certainly in digital perspective, people in three ways. Um, you've got login processes. You can use personalized URLs. You can use cookies. That's the traditional way of identifying people who interact with you online. Um, the DMA did some sort of study to try and, and sort of quantify this, and, and they've, they've sort of categorized data into sort of digital data into sort of three groups. And there's anonymous data. These, these are people who come into our websites, um, do something where we can't identify them. Um, now, things like Google Analytics, we try, all of us try to do that. And there are a number of different companies that kind of take the Google Analytics thing to one step further, I think people like Lead Forensics and a few others that I noticed out there. But they're all relying on the IP address to basically identify who's coming into our websites. And, and it, it's still fairly anonymous. Um, you know, if we have a visit from Lloyds Bank into our website, great, Lloyds have been to our website. But we don't know which one of the 100,000 employees have been in. So it's quite limited in terms of what we can do with it. So it's good feedback, but it's still fairly anonymous. So it's hard to build a relationship with people you don't know. Uh, it's impossible. <laughs> um, so then, then we move on to the next sort of pool of data, and these are people that are, that are I, classified as recognized, and these are people who might interact with us and log in, and we can identify who they are. The depth of the relationship that we have with them is greater because we know who they are. Um, but again, it's not as deep as it could be. The depth of relationship really comes with customers, and they're people who we're identifying going into our, into our websites or interacting with us, um, and we can track what they're doing, and they're interacting, they're buying, we're getting, collecting all of this information. But the, cha the challenge for digital data is really to look at this anonymous group. And essentially, um, we, we term it data connectivity, and there's a lack of data connectivity, um, certainly when it comes to a single customer view. And I, I'll give an example for such as someone like, uh, say, Tesco's. We're all familiar with Tesco's. Um, they use their club card um, uh, loyalty program to help identify who we are. If we go into Tesco's and pay cash, they can't identify who we are. They can't tie that transaction to us. Or if we use credit card, they're not allowed to do that. But as soon as we apply a loyalty card, they tie the transaction to us as an individual, and they can start to build up a transactional history as to what we're buying as individuals. That works great. If we go online and buy from them, again, they can link us back and put us in the database. But if I tweet something about Tesco's or stick something on Facebook, they can track that that's happening, but they can't link it back to me as an individual. You know, for example, with something like Twitter, my, my Twitter name is not easily identifiable to them, and it's not repeatable in here either. But no one can actually link that back. So there's a big gap between between the digital space and the data that's being collected and, and the real world databases in terms of building a view of our customers and how they're interacting with us and how they're engaging with us. And so that is a challenge. There's a technical issue in terms of how that can be done. Um, and there's also a, a, an ownership issue. People like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn are owning the content. They want to lock it down. They want to keep it to, keep it to themselves. So until that gets unlocked, it's very, very difficult to build that whole picture of your customer. You can look at them if they're interacting with you um, in, in store or online, if they're purchasing, if they're logging into your website. But in the social media space, it's much harder to tie that back and get a whole picture of, of your customers and prospects and how they're engaging with you and how, how they're interacting with you. So there is a, a lack of connectivity. Um, I think if that gap can be bridged, then, then th in terms of all the data that we are collecting and, and the, the massive increase is, is often down to social, certainly in terms of uh, marketing managers, if we can somehow bridge that gap, then, then we've really got sort of data utopia because we're then following not only in terms of how they actually interact customers and prospects interact with us in terms of their spend, but we're looking at how they engage with us too, and we get that whole, whole picture. But, but that's one of the challenges of digital data, and one of the issues that marketeers were going to face. 
So that nicely link, leads me on to, to the single customer view. And before I go on, go on about the single customer view, um, I'd like to just have a show of hands. Everyone familiar with the term single customer view? If we could have a show of hands. Okay, a fair few of you. How many of you have actually achieved a single customer view? Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. So there's a fair few people who are familiar with the concept. Very few people have actually achieved it. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, a single customer view is a, a holistic view of your customer and prospect. And it's being, being able to look at them in their entirety. Um, I'll give you an example of how I might interact with an organization. I might go into a shop and buy something, and, and what I do in that shop could be put in a database somewhere. I might interact with that organization via my uh, mobile phone or smartphone in some way, and perhaps with, a, with an app. Uh, I might interact with them online. I might email them, perhaps a query or whatever. I might send them a letter. People still send letters. Um, or I'm actually ring them up. And all of this, the way I interact could be recorded in different databases. And for a business to get that single holistic view of me and how I behave and what I spend is very difficult. So ideally, you want to tie that all together and put it into one place. You can actually view the customer as, 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 as a whole. Come, I mentioned Tesco as an example. They're a good, good example of an organization that really has gone some way to achieving that by using their loyalty card. So if you interact with them and use your loyalty card, they can tie it all back. And other retailers have, have, have done similar things. Um, what are the benefits of a single customer view? Well, 72% um, of people recognize, this is some um, research done by experience, 72% of people know that using, using customer data will improve business and, and customer satisfaction. However, just 16% have achieved it. And it's quite interesting because probably 20, 30 people put up their hands when they understood what a single customer view was, and I think we only had two or three hands up in terms of those who have actually achieved it. So there's, again, there's a desire to do it, um, but, but achieving it is, is, you know, is problematic in its own right. So if we look at some of the benefits of it, um, I think customers can be managed better, and, and it can increase your loyalty. Um, if you think of the financial services sector, who, who are actually quite good at achieving it, if you think of your bank, if you bank with Barclays, you might have your current account, savings account, investment account, you might have your mortgage with them, you might have a Barclays card, credit card. You're interacting with Barclays card in many different ways across different divisions and different product, products. And for them to manage me better, and I, perhaps if I want a new car loan, I phone them up, they've got to be able to credit rate me, they've got to be able to look at my history and do that in real time. So they've got to tie all these different products and all my different interactions across different different parts of the business and, and basically have a real-time view of exactly where I am at that moment in time and decide whether I'm worthy or not to, or whether I'm credit worthy or not to, to, to receive that car loan and, and look at my overall borrowing and perhaps their overall risk and exposure to me. So it enables them to manage their customers better if they have, have that single view. From me personally, enhances my customer service levels because essentially they're going to manage me better, and if they manage me better, I'm going to get better customer service. So, so I'm happier. So there are business benefits and there are, there are customer benefits. Um, there's the obvious cost reductions. Um, you know, if I'm interacting with the same business in different ways and they don't have that joined up view, that single customer view, I may be receiving communications from the same business but in different places. I may be getting duplicated communications. Um, so by, by reducing the number of communications I get and reducing the duplication, for the business there's a cost saving because they're not having to spend so much on essentially wasting money on contacting me for the same things. Um, for the, benef the benefit for the customers, obviously, I don't keep getting confusing offers, perhaps competing offers. Um, so, so there are sort of tangible benefits there. Um, so it gets more accurate campaign execution. If you've got that single view of the customer, you understand them better. And if you understand them better, you can then start to target them more effectively. Um, and certainly from a customer point of view, um, I don't want to receive communications that, that are unsolicited or not so relevant, haven't been thought out. Um, and in, I'll use the financial services sector again as an example because they've been doing this quite well for a number of years. If you go back 20, 30 years ago, the credit card companies would mail you, inviting you to take out a credit card. You pick up the phone, you apply to the credit card, and they go, oh, sorry, you, you, you're not credit worthy. So they've gone to all the effort of communicating with you, spending all that money. For me then to engage and interact with them, for, the, for them to then turn me down, um, it leaves a sour taste in my mouth. It doesn't look good on them. It kind of backfires. So simply by, 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 by looking at their customer base, prospect base, pre-screening them, making sure people are credit worthy, it can ensure that people who are mailed can actually have the card, so, it, so um, they're certainly going to get less complaints, um, and, and it enables more accurate communi communication. 
all of this leads ultimately to, to improve response and ROI for, for the marketeer. Um, because if you know their customers and you know, you know them well, um, you, you can target things more effectively. Another example, and I'll use Tesco's again, is I often get um, uh, communications regarding pet insurance. Well, they can see that when I go in and buy my cat food every week, the chances are I've got a cat. And if I've got a cat, I might need pet insurance. It would be much harder for them to target that particular product at a wide audience and quite expensive. But by data mining and getting the view of me and how I'm interacting with them, they get to understand me better. So they can give me an offer that's better for me, and so that's the benefit to me as a customer. For them, they're more likely to get a better response and ultimately an ROI. So there are tangible benefits to be gained by having that single view of the customer. Um, I'm going to have to probably speed up because I'm running out of time, actually. I didn't think I could talk that long about data. Um, we did some work with um, East of England Co-op, another retailer, to give you a little bit of background there, sort of a mid-sized retailer. And they had, they had this similar issues to many retailers or many businesses that are interacting with people in different channels. So they have a, have a database, essentially, but they're getting feeds from EPOS, um, the point-of-sale um, um, kits. They're getting stuff from online, events that they run, promotions, and their membership base. And they've got all of this stuff coming at them and stored in different places, and they can't make head nor tail of it. So essentially, it's a case of creating a single customer view so that they can actually have that holistic view of each and every customer that they have. And one of the benefits that were features to them was having that holistic view. The benefit was uh, ca the, the capability of analyzing and segmenting their customers more effectively, which off the back of that could formulate specific mar marketing strategy for different segments and different groups. Obviously, with the an analysis and segmentation, it enables them to create those highly, highly targeted offers. And if I'm going to use Tesco as an example, the pet insurance, because the chances are I've got a pet, I've been buying cat food every week for the last 15 years, and I might need to insure my pet. There's also a relationship between spend and engagement, which has been harder to measure before. Um, we, we interact with companies on many different levels. We might be a customer, we might spend money, but certainly with, with, with online, we may engage with them. We may um, turn up to an event they run or an in-store promotion. Um, but it's been difficult to measure engagement and how we engage with the business and how we might spend money with them. But if you bring that view into one place, you can then start to look and see, you know, if people engage with you more, will they spend more money? Or if they're engaging with you a lot but not spending money, what strategy would you need to do to perhaps get them to spend more money? Or look at the correlation between the two. So in terms of a summary, big data is here and it will affect us all. Um, we view data as the new oil and companies that can harness it and use it effectively will we'll definitely gain a competitive advantage over those that don't. And I think if you have multiple channels, and most of us do now, certainly offline and online, the number of channels open to us is growing. If you've got multiple channels, you're going to be collecting lots of different data in lots of different places. And if you can put all that data together into one place, um, your, your marketing will be more effective.